Hello and welcome to the second chapter of the Eggplant Performance Tutorial Series. In this chapter I'll begin by talking about the system under test, also known as the SUT. The second half of the chapter will focus more on the importance of planning by showing you an example performance test plan for the system we're wanting to test. Throughout the tutorial series we'll be dealing with one very specific SUT, namely one called Knob Commerce. I'm sure most of you have by now done some amount of online shopping. Well, Knobcommerce is a very typical example of an e-commerce website. You can register as a new user, browse a catalogue of products, add items to a virtual cart, and place an order by checking out the cart. However, unlike most e-commerce sites, this one won't actually deliver you any goods, so sorry folks. Its existence is merely to be the subject of our load tests, the poor thing. What's great about Knobcommerce is that it is an open source product. This means you can just download it from the internet and set it up on your own machine. Now, if you've had previous experience with Microsoft's Internet Information Services, also known as simply IIS, then I would highly recommend setting up your own instance, especially if you want to implement the examples shown during the tutorial series for yourself. We won't delve into the nitty-gritty of how to go about setting up an instance of Knobcommerce. We'll leave that up to you as it is fairly well documented online, but here are a few starting pointers. Now you'll most likely want to download the web no source archive from the Knobcommerce download page. This is much easier to deploy because you don't actually have to compile any of the source code in order to get it to work. If you're downloading that archive, you'll need WinRAR or similar in order to decompress it. Uh, WinRAR can be downloaded from the rarlab.com uh, link that's displayed on the screen now. If you're on Windows 10, you won't actually be able to use Microsoft's Web Matrix, which is what is recommended on the Knobcommerce site, so you'll need to get a hold of and use IIS in order to deploy it instead. The Knobcommerce documentation is a good place to start for that. Once you've got the site configured correctly, and you've run through the initialization wizard, you should be in a position where you can simply fire up the website in your browser. Note that in my case I have a DNS entry set up in my host file, so I can simply type knobcommerce instead of the IP address. Uh, don't worry if that's not something you've set up yourself, the site should work fine with the IP address too. There we go, there's our knobcommerce system under test. So what happens now? Well, you'll probably want to figure out what it is that you want to test on this site. And that is largely, in most cases, going to be determined by what you expect your users to be doing when they're logging onto the site. So, uh, with an e-commerce site, that's usually quite easy to tell. There's going to be a certain amount of searching going on. Uh, so you'll be searching, or the users will be searching for products that they would be interested in. Uh, they'll also be registering uh, onto the site uh, in order to uh, be able to then uh, purchase items. And uh, we'll also be wanting to check out that cart probably as well. So that's sort of the end-to-end -end of, of a typical e-commerce transaction. Now, before we get too carried away and start talking about recording and creating scripts, it's probably a good idea to think about uh, planning. So, uh, you know, you want to have some a, a pretty good idea of what it is you want to test, and you probably want to share that with others uh, in the company uh, that you might be working with, uh, so that they're aware of what's going on. Uh, but it also gives them a chance to perhaps suggest uh, things that you may have missed as part of your analysis of uh, what it is you should be testing with the site. So in order to do that, uh, we've got a performance test plan. So here's an example performance test plan that's been prepared for this uh, particular uh, project, shall we say. Uh, so there's just a front page there. We've got a table of contents. Um, and then we've got a little introduction section here that's just saying you know, what the, what's in this document. And one of the key things in there at the very top uh, is going to be some talk of the object objectives and the uh, testing requirements. 
so as part of this, imagine that uh, we have had some requirements communicated to us. Uh, the idea is that we establish a baseline set of response times for key transactions. Uh, so the baseline, uh, in most cases, that's uh, described as uh, what we can expect when there's pretty much no load on the system at all for, for the given transaction. So if there's only a single user on the system, what kind of response times are each of the transactions generating? Uh, so here's the, that list of transactions that we want to keep an eye out on. Uh, so it's submitting a login request, performing searches for various items on the, on the store, adding these items to the cart, viewing and opening the cart, uh, performing the checkout operation, uh, as part of which we'll also be submitting an order. Um, in order to be able to do this very first one, uh, we will actually also need to be able to create uh, users as well. So that's probably one of the transactions we'll want to include as part of this too. The second uh, requirement here, so the first one, just to establish those baseline figures, uh, the second part is actually to run a load test. And for that we want to simulate 50 concurrent users. Uh, so that's 50 virtual users that we want to have running uh, these transactions, these scripts, all at the same time. And as part of that, um, we have some criteria that need to be met um, So in order for the testing to be successful. So we have to ensure that the average response times do not exceed two seconds for the above transactions. So we're, we're saying, you know, the above transactions here, they're pretty critical, and so we don't want any of them to exceed uh, two seconds average response time. Uh, the second one is uh, ensuring the average response times do not exceed five seconds for any transaction. So um, this is for transactions outside of these ones that we might encounter as part of doing these. So there might be some that aren't even in this list, but they're mandatory steps in order to be able to do these other transactions. And for those, we're going to be a bit more lenient uh, and, and give them up to five seconds average uh, to respond. Another requirement here is that the web server CPU utilization does not exceed 75% uh, for prolonged periods of time. So um, if we're finding ourselves sitting at 80% on average uh, you know, for the majority of the test, then that's not a comfortable place to be. You'll probably at that point already see uh, higher response times. And so this is just to say, you know, we want to make sure that we're not completely destroying the CPU on this machine. Uh, we want to stay within uh, some acceptable uh, uh, limits. This last one here is just to point out that we're not just going to be looking at CPU utilization, we're obviously going to look at uh, the hardware overall and ensuring that uh, no limits anywhere uh, are encountered. As well as the uh, objectives and requirements, uh, the document will usually talk a bit more about the application itself and what it was written in or what kind of database it's using. Uh, there will usually be some kind of network topology diagram that shows how all the different components are connected. Um, risks and assumptions is always worth talking about as well. So, you know, a pretty important one in this case is that we're uh, going to assume that the test environment uh, that we've set up to do this testing is exactly half of the capacity of the production environment. Um, you know, that's not always going to be the case and it's not always going to be easy uh, to, to translate capacity between two environments, so it's important that uh, any assumptions are, are listed in this document. It's sort of a way of covering yourself in case anyone starts questioning the validity of your results, so that's actually quite important. Uh, and likewise, uh, you know, user concurrency and think times. Uh, the concept of think time, uh, that's the, the amount of time that a user does nothing between performing actions. Uh, what that value um, actually ends up being uh, matters a lot as far as the amount of load that's actually generated. So some thought needs to go into uh, what that value should actually be. Uh, but yeah, um, once we get into um, more detail here, we, we, we can see how we actually want to configure our tests, you know, how long we actually want to run it for, uh, again, what kind of think times we want to be using. So here we're using an, going to uh, use an average of 15 seconds between performing actions. And so the idea is that you know you can refer to this as you're putting together your scripts and your tests uh, to ensure that you're, you're doing what uh, you set out to do in the first place. 
That's it for now. Uh, so in the next chapter we'll be looking at recording these scripts and that'll be done in the Eggplant Performance Studio component. So in the next chapter we should finally see some uh, of Eggplant Performance in action. So hope to see you then. Bye-bye.